All right, we're back. So our next panel is a new panel. It's the second of the three master class. So we talked about being investigated. Now we're going to talk about how to keep the SEC from suing your client. And I think we have a really great panel for this topic. Let me start with introducing Stacy Bogert, Associate Director at the SEC. She previously served as a Senior Counsel and Assistant Director in Enforcement. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks for coming. Uh, Sandra Hanna, a partner at Miller and Chevalier in DC. Chevalier, isn't it? Chevalier, Chevalier sorry. Um, she spent nine years as a, um, at a premier SEC enforcement boutique law firm that she co-founded, and I'm very grateful that Sandra's here with us. Uh, Lara Maraban is a partner at Sidley Austin in New York. She joined Sidley very recently um, after serving 15 years at the SEC, where she was most recently the acting director of the New York Regional Office, and her career at the SEC also includes supervising that office's enforcement division as an associate regional director. Welcome, Lara. Uh, I always say Bill McLucas needs no introduction, and I'm never confident enough to just give him no introduction. <laughs> so I'm going to do that again. So he, he's a chair of the firm security department at Wilmer Hale, one of the most sought after advisors to public companies and boards uh, dealing with corporate crises and related issues. He joined that firm after serving for more than eight years as a director of enforcement in the SEC, uh, longer than any other enforcement director in the history of the commission. Finally, our moderator, Brad Bondi, a partner at Cahill Gordon, where he's chair of the firm's white collar practice. Brad regularly serves as a senior advisor to boards of directors, audit committees, special committees, and others, and formerly, formerly served as counsel to two SEC commissioners for enforcement actions and regulatory rulemaking. Brad, let me turn it over to you. All right. Well. This panel is entitled, How to Keep the SEC from Suing Your Client. And I thought about this and is, is divided into somewhat two parts. One is steps that could be taken ahead of time before the SEC Enforcement Division gets involved. And second, then, how to deal once the SEC actually calls you. So focusing on the first part, steps to take before the SEC Enforcement Division becomes involved. Um, Stacy, um, from an SEC standpoint, you've been involved in many high-profile cases as an associate director, and, and Laura is as the former acting director of the New York Regional Office. So I, I'd like to start with Stacy and, and just ask, what are the things that you would look for that a company could do in advance, um, preventative measures or prophylactic measures that a company could take to um, to discourage the SEC from ultimately bringing a lawsuit if there's a problem. Um, let me start off with the standard disclaimer that the views I express today are my own, not those of the commission, the commissioners, or the SEC staff. Um, but I, I guess uh, I would say um, part of uh, trying to avoid an enforcement action in the first place is not engaging in the, the misconduct, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I highly recommend. Um, so, you know, how, how to do that is the million dollar question, but um, I, I think one thing I would emphasize is uh, having a robust culture of compliance, um, something that's tailored for the company's specific business and risks, um, making sure that your company's on top of SEC rules, um, and responding uh, to SEC priorities and initiatives. Um, and I think uh, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, short of preventing misconduct, obviously your clients should take steps to ensure that it's an isolated incident, um, not a widespread occurrence of noncompliance that puts you in the best spot. And um, the uh, pervasiveness or complicity uh, within the organization uh, can impact an investigation and outcomes. And I think corporate culture comes from the top. So making sure there's a, a strong need to um, foster a culture of compliance and not misconduct is, is one key uh, factor. Laura, from both your time at the SEC as the acting director of New the New York Regional Office and now in private practice, anything to add to that? Anything else that a company could do in advance aside from not doing the conduct that, um, that you'd recommend? Sure. 
And um, being in private practice for a whole two months now, I have to say that not having to give the standard SEC disclaimer <laughs> is pretty exciting. Um, and also, I'm still um, suffering from occasionally referring to the SEC still as we. So if I do that, just you know, kick me. That doesn't help with clients, but that's just a tip. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I'll just echo a lot of what Stacy said. Um, you know, starting with the culture of compliance, the tone from the top. Um, we saw in the recent um, e uh, communications cases that just came out, the SEC relied a lot on the fact that senior officers and um, personnel were the ones who were texting and including texting their subordinates. So, um, using that as sort of an extreme example, um, you know, starting with that culture of compliance starting from the top and imbuing the whole organization with that I think is really important. And the second point that Stacy made that I also think is really important is not taking a static approach to these things. Um, recognizing that businesses change over time, companies grow, making sure to have that periodic review of your policies and procedures to make sure that everything that you're doing is to ensure that there is that culture of compliance. Now, Bill, from your standpoint, if when you're hired and you realize there's a high likelihood of an SEC investigation around the corner and you're hired by a company, what steps are you advising the company to take? What sort of actions are you doing ahead of that call from the SEC? Well, look, the process piece of being investigated is usually the thing that is Everybody wants to resist early on. What are they doing? I, this is crazy. They have no jurisdiction. This is irrelevant. I'm going to call my congressman. I mean, you name it, it, it happens to all of us. So the first thing you do is manage the state of mind of the client to say, look, at the end of the day, um, whether there's anything here or there isn't is not the immediate priority. The immediate priority is we need to navigate the investigation, deal with the staff, um, and get you from here to the back end so we can make those arguments. But, but calling your congressman is not in the first 25 steps that is going to be constructive, and I would urge you not to do that. Yeah. Sandra, what about you? Do you get on the line with the Congress, or um, <laughs> do, you, uh, do, you, do you tell them, ah, uh, <laughs> Bill Not doesn't have the Bill doesn't have the connections in Congress like I do. What what do you um, what are you telling clients early on when it looks like any second the SEC will be calling the client or you? Um, what are you telling them to to do? I think that Bill is right. The initial conversations are really hard because their the client is very resistant. But in general, the key is to get it right in the first instance, right? It's to scope the investigation properly. It's to do all the right things on the front end so that you've made defensible decisions if and when you are bringing it to Stacy, for instance. Um, and it's going to be expensive, and it's going to take resources and commitment. Um, and I would say the first few weeks are typically, for me, spent on that hurdle. So they really can you know, get through the wall of resistance, get over the urge to, to call their congressman or their golfing buddy who's friends with the congressman. Um, and it's a, it's a mental game in the beginning before anything else. Bill, after the SEC gets involved and you've gotten that call and you've gotten the initial subpoenas, um, how are you running through the calculus with your client about cooperation versus aggressive advocacy? And does cooperation mean anything any, these days for a company under investigation? Well, the first part of the question, which is cooperation versus aggressive advocacy, in the process itself, in responding to the investigation, aggressive advocacy, uh, depending upon how one defines that, is not a constructive answer to where you're going to be at the end of the process. I mean, we can discuss the timetable for the request, the relevance of certain documents, the scope of the, of the uh, document demand, but, but engaging in a process where the SEC's immediate impression, which will carry through the rest of the investigation, not going to cooperate, to hell with you, you have no jurisdiction here. My client is a, has done nothing wrong, and we'll, we're going to 
battle you at every turn. That's a losing strategy in terms of the process because whether at the end of the day there's any substance to the, con the, the concerns about whether someone violated the securities laws, the process itself will destroy the client. It's expensive. You lose whatever perspective, goodwill, and equity you get on the back end if there is an issue. And it, it's, it, it simply uh, it makes the client feel good for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then the client realizes in a subpoena enforcement action, now it's public. Now my name's in the paper. They've put all this stuff in here about I might have done this. I didn't do anything wrong. What the hell's going on? So the, the, the wisest strategy is basically to, um, you, you don't, everyone uses the term cooperation. It's a subpoena. It's not an invitation to a party. <laughs> so the, the, the wisest approach is manage the process, yeah. preserve your own credibility while you're doing it because you're going to need it on the back end. And one of the reasons clients hire most of the people in this room is your credibility. And if you squander that by your advocacy on process and defend, you know, doing the things that m many clients who aren't lawyers want you to do, at the end of the day, you probably hurt your client a lot more than you've helped them. That's right, Bill. I think you have to commit, get the client to commit to an, a, a process that has integrity um, <clears throat> and to play it straight down the middle. And that is, that is really hard, client management. Yeah, and, and as uh, the second part of the question was, what's the value of cooperation? Well, on the process piece of it, the value is you're complying with the subpoena and you're, 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 you're getting through it, but um, you're going to need something at the end of the process, and we can talk about that when you get to the conclusion and negotiating with the staff, but that... 31-year-old staff lawyer across the table is more powerful than anybody else in the whole damn building because his or her view of your client and the record and the facts is going to carry the day. The director, the associate director, are they going to listen to me? They, they might, but are they going to listen to the staff lawyer and the staff accountant and the first level? And so if I've, in a sense, fought with, poisoned, ruined that relationship, when you get to the issue of what's the consequence of all this if there is a violation or a problem, uh, you know, I may have eroded my ability to negotiate or to argue or to get some concessions because I've alienated probably the most important person in the process, which is that person that's doing the day-to-day -day work and knows the record. Sandra, is the calculus any different when you're representing an individual? Um, that's a hard one. Not, no, the answer is, is fundamentally no. Individuals caught in investigations, Bill is representing the company, I have an individual, you know, how, you still have to do sort of the work on the front end to get the clients, you know, in the words of Biggie Smalls, his mind right. Um, around working on the investigation um, and committing to a transparent process and being helpful to company counsel uh, through that. And that's not necessarily where they, they start. Clients, this is typically the most significant professional thing, thing in their professional life, the most serious event for them. It has career-ending consequences. The, it affects their ability to support their families. And so even more than with big corporations, you really need to spend the time walking them through the process. Clients are very quick to go to the end, to the end of their career, and try to peek around any corners. So. Um, it's important to get them to see the value of the process. If you have a bad actor, that's one thing. But if for most people that we represent in the C-suite or senior management, they're sort of on the bubble. And they want to know how to keep their jobs. And the way to do that is not to tell um, the Wilmer folks to pound sand uh, in the course of their investigation. It's just not going to work. So same sort of client management issues on the front end are really critical. A lot harder, too. The human aspect of this with individuals, as you know, 
And I worry that it's lost on the staff sometimes. I mean, these people, they have kids, they have jobs, they have lives, and they may have made a mistake. The world's a lot more divided into shades of gray than black and white. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of an SEC enforcement action against an individual, particularly in a regulated industry, you're ruined. And just, you know, my observation over the years is that aspect of the process has moved away from what I was taught when I was a young staff lawyer by Sporkin, which is you got to have a little Rachmanis, <laughs> which is a little humanity uh, when you deal with people. But, but also the strategy for individuals has to be to get them to tell you everything so that you can tell the firm doing the investigation or Stacy and her people the context for all of these decisions. We're typically operating in the world of professional judgment, right? And two reasonable people can disagree on what the right thing to do was. We could reach different conclusions, but if there was a process around that decision and many people were involved and uh, you really need to as, as counsel to effectively represent them, we need to understand all of that stuff. How many emails did they get in a day? Who did they, did they focus on this? Did they talk to anyone about this? Who did what? You really need to get your client to understand that we're not just talking about whatever the potential violation is. We need to talk about their whole career, their whole year, everything that's on their plate. Um, all the areas of responsibility that they have. And by doing that, we can help Bill have a better investigation, right? And maybe we can frame things for the staff so when it comes to making decisions about that individual, they have the context to exercise prosecutorial discretion in a more meaningful way. Well, Laura, you, you, you have the benefit of, of, of knowing the secrets and now being in the defense side. Um, looking back to your time, what, is, what has been the effective approaches and tools that you saw as the acting director of the New York office and, and prior to that the um, associate director for enforcement? What tools did you see employed that you, you look back now and you say, wow, that was really good or that was really effective? That changed my mind on a matter. Sure. I think there's a couple things. Um, I think the first thing is if you know I'm going to be at a meeting, I think the, the key is to have a goal for that meeting, to have a particular topic that you want to talk about, whether it be, you know, is there going to be scienter-based liability, is it going to be a negligence-based charge, um, are individuals going to be included? Like have a goal for the meeting of a topic that should be, you want to have covered, and really like know the facts really, really well. Um, that is always going to be what can change someone's mind know the facts, and be able to present the facts in a way that, that, to Sandra's point, covers the entire picture, lets the staff see what that person was going through during that day, and also addresses any, you know, what might be called problematic emails head on. Like, we acknowledge there's this email, but look at it in the context of everything else, and this is really the import you should take away from it. I've found those presentations to be the most helpful. Stacy, what about you? What, is, what has been effective that you've seen defense counsel do? I could spend a lot of time talking about what's not effective. <laughs> <laughs> we know all that. Go ahead. <laughs> Video uh, Obviously not you. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I would say, I echo, I think, some of the things that Lara has just said. Um, you know, uh, if you're getting to the Wells process and it's the first time our team um, or I, as an associate director, are hearing a particular <clears throat> argument, uh, it's too late. I don't want to say it's too late in the sense that it, our mind is made up and we won't change it, but I think it's more efficient and effective to be talking about issues early. Um, let's, let's figure out early on in the investigation what factual issues there are, what legal issues there may be um, that can be more efficient, I think, for everyone involved. Um, I think in instances where uh, the, the staff has a better argument, acknowledge it. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to fight uh, every single thing that's on the table. So being targeted um, on the arguments, uh, to Lara's point, you know, coming in, you know, let's talk about a particular topic, being targeted on um, the arguments that really matter to your client, or if we're talking settlement, the, the pieces of, of what a case might look like that really matter. Um, and then the flip side of that is um, uh, 
focus on things that are important to us. Ask us. Ask us what's important. Um, I think it's a more productive dialogue um, and can be a more productive investigation. So. And, and Stacy, to that point, do early meetings and the use of white papers and the, the pre-Wells type tactics, are those effective? Um, it, it could be. It really just depends on the case. Um, I, I think, um, you know, one thing I want to say about the Wells process, and this echoes something that Bill was saying, um, I think a successful Wells process, um, successful white paper process, whatever it may be that you're doing at the end, um, all of that starts long before you get to the end of an investigation. And so establishing credibility, as Bill said, I think that's uh, really important. Um, and whether it's through cooperation or whether it's through otherwise, I think um, co uh, having the Knowing that you have uh, credibility, or knowing me as a SEC staff member, having someone uh, across the table who has uh, behaved fairly, I think, um, can really help make it a more productive investigation and discussion. Um, the, the flip side of that, and I'll, I'll just jump into it since I said I could talk about what's not effective. Um, and I think you've heard um, a number of my colleagues at different times, you know, over the years, have talked about, you know, some of the. Um, bad conduct that we see from lawyers representing their clients, and, and um, it, it's not serving anybody. It's not serving your client, and it's not helping facilitate uh, getting an investigation done, which ultimately, I think, what your client's hoping to get through the other side. And so unreasonable delays in document productions or scheduling witnesses, spurious privilege claims, um, coaching witnesses during testimony, ignoring conflicts of interest, in particular, personal attacks on staff. Um, None of those things are going to help your credibility, and it's, and it's just going to hurt your arguments when it comes time to doing the wells or the white paper. Um, it, it, it really hurts your credibility. Bill, you've spoken about the process. Um, at what point do you start being proactive, though? Um, and what are you looking for in terms of, of timing to go into the staff, to make a presentation, to engage them on the facts? Um, versus complying with the subpoena, doing what you're supposed to do, and just letting the process run its course? I mean, normally the staff doesn't want to get there until everything's done and buttoned up. And generally that is the way it works, but there are times when you may want to request a meeting uh, and an opportunity to make an affirmative presentation. That's usually going to be key to uh, the facts and the law. And without necessarily attacking the staff doing the inquiry, if you genuinely believe that the, the inferences from the record are just way beyond or off the mark, um, it's, it's a reasonable thing to try to do and get the right people in the room. Um, you got to think carefully about when and who, because you're only going to get one or two of those meetings and you don't want to waste your opportunity, and then at the end of it, you're going to say, well, we want to come in and we want to have a conversation with the associate director to put forward our presentation on why we don't think there's a violation over here. To your point, uh, I think when you have a problem, it, you know, conceding, look, we recognize there are some issues over here. You don't have to confess guilt, but you have to basically, it, it, it uh, increases your credibility to say, we understand there are fair issues to talk about over here. But on these issues, let me articulate to you why I think you're just mistaken. I mean, the timing on that is critical. Normally, you're going to wait until the, the inquiry is you know, close to being done, and then you're going to ask for an opportunity to be heard. I actually think that those submissions and white papers are, can be really helpful. Um, but it, again, it, it's a question of picking the right time to do it and not foreclosing the ability when you really need it to go in and have a meeting with the senior most supervisor on the case. Sandra, you've tried cases against the SEC and the US Attorney's Office. <clears throat> um, at, at what point um, do you think you signal to the staff that you're willing to litigate, um, that you're willing to push it. Um, and does, does that, is that effective or, or should you just keep your powder dry and see what ultimately happens there? 
Um, the, the answer to that has changed over time, right? It used to be that no one ever litigated, uh, no companies ever litigated. Now we see a handful of cases there, which frankly still surprise me given the collateral consequences. So um, I, I guess reasonable, reasonable people can disagree on the effective of, effective of that for a company, the staff is willing to litigate. I think the, you'll hear from the panel uh, this afternoon that they often do so and often win, and they're not scared to, um, and they're, they're just not scared to anymore. It's a different calculus for individuals now. Um, I don't think that you should make idle threats. I think you need to be credible and be an honest broker of things. And if that is where your individual client is going to end up, then just I would be upfront about it all along, um, including the factors that will contribute to a litigated outcome instead of a settled resolution, like he'll take a bar for a short period of time, but not five years. Right, and if you're open and honest and transparent with the staff about what those triggers are that will send you to litigation, I think it just goes to your, your credibility. I do expect that given the kind of sanctions the staff is seeking from individuals now, um, we are gonna continue to see an increase in the number of, of litigations uh, for individuals, which will you know, keep many people in this room busy, but honestly, I think is an unfortunate outcome in many cases um, that is only the result of individuals feeling like they have to fight for their lives because they couldn't reach a reasonable settled resolution. We're seeing cases, I think, come in the pipeline now that we can all agree would have been settled um, five years ago, but are now being litigated. And it's, it's difficult to advise clients uh, on what their likely outcomes will be when we don't have you know, years of precedent for those individual cases. It's a, it's a bit of a different world now and a difficult time for individuals. Bill, do you, think, do you see that we're going to have more companies and more individuals pushing back and litigating cases? You're going to see a lot of pushback. I, I, you know, at the end of the day, regulated entities, <clears throat> people that are, you know, basically can't be at war with the SEC are under enormous pressure. It doesn't mean you won't <clears throat> see litigation, <clears throat> but it's a very, very complicated equation and analysis. And, um, for a regulated entity, somebody in the industry, the collateral consequences risk is enormous. And in this environment, because of some of the political pressure and the rhetoric you hear from people who believe that waiver of collateral consequences is akin to selling your soul to the devil, uh, it, it, it raises a very, very challenging dynamic. Public companies, a little different. Um, but you know, I would think we're going to see the same mix of litigation going forward. And much of the pushback is going to be on relief and on the demand that I think has escalated over the years that we need big numbers, we need, you know, and at some point the SEC is going to get into litigation and ask for penalties and there's going to be a requirement that you demonstrate the predicate under the statute for that dollar amount. And the SEC can do it. They can calculate the number of filings and mailings, and a court's going to look at them and say, come on. And I, I think that's going to be the tension. Whether that will inhibit the agency, though, because that's not the sort of thought process that the commission goes through when they think about, boy, this is really bad conduct. Let's go get a half, half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And if they don't want to settle it, we'll litigate it. And, and that that's... Part of the dynamic right now that I see as affecting the pushback on penalties, and there, there will be cases where people say, the hell with it, let's litigate, because we're not going to pay X amount of money for this mistake. Mm -hmm. Stacy, when companies are across the table from you <clears throat> and negotiating for cooperation credit, um, what do you look for? And many of us in the room sometimes question whether the so-called Seaboard report is still alive and well, or is there something else that is necessary to get that cooperation credit when it ultimately comes to negotiating a settlement? 
So cooperation is live and well. And I think Lara was actually planning to talk about some of the more recent cases, but uh, you'll see it frequently um, in uh, the settled orders we put out, um, and we often describe what companies are doing. Um, Self-reporting, cooperation, and remediation are the, the three key components of uh, you know what we're looking for. And I think um, it's important to uh, consider it needs to be meaningful cooperation. And so um, it, it's not enough just to respond to SEC requests or subpoenas and be polite. Um, that, that's just obeying the law uh, and complying with subpoenas. So um, you can look to the cases we bring for examples, but you know, essentially cooperation um, can mean uh, proactively identifying wrongdoing, uh, self-reporting. Um, taking steps to further uh, or advance the staff's investigation, uh, working with the staff towards an efficient resolution, um, or also remediation, um, and, and that can be a key component. So proactively remediating wrongdoing, whether that's new policies and procedures, um, the independent consultant or outside experts, uh, clawbacks of bonuses, um, and holding individuals accountable who are involved in the misconduct. Is it more difficult, Stacy, to get that cooperation credit if there has not been self-reporting? In other words, if, if the company is reacting to a subpoena, it catches them off guard, and they're having to, to go through the process. Is it, is it, is it more difficult without the self-reporting? I, I wouldn't say that. I, I wouldn't say that any one factor that I've just described is, is determinative. It's, it's the cumulative factors and also the, you know, the facts and circumstances of the underlying case. Um, Laura, you've, you've um, read plenty of well submissions in your day. Um, what, what moves the needle <clears throat> in the well submission uh, in terms of cooperation credit there, that, that where you look at an organization and say, yeah, we'll give them a break um, because they've done X, Y, and Z. Um, we've talked about complying with subpoenas and, and going above and beyond that, we've talked about self-reporting remediation, but, but what are those things when it comes down to the tangibles there um, that have really moved the needle for you that you look back and say, yeah, they did X, Y, and Z. They did above and beyond just normally complying with that subpoena. I think Steve um, talked about this this morning and, and summarized it in a, in a very nice way. Um, you want to make the SEC's investigation more efficient and um, get them to a place more quickly using fewer resources. And you want to, at the end of the day, be able to explain to the SEC how you have done that. Um, and I think that is the most effective um, way to present the cooperation. Um, it's hard from the defense side, because there's no chart on, um, you know, if company does X, Y, and Z, you know, their penalty will be reduced by 50%. There, there isn't that sort of clear-cut calculus that a company can make um, you know, starting from the beginning as to how they're going to cooperate and what benefit that will get them. And, and that's because the SEC wants to, you know, take into account all the facts and circumstances um, and come up in each individual case with the remedy that they believe is pr appropriate given the, all of the facts and circumstances. And so I think, um, you know, it's a difficult calculus to make from the outside and from the beginning, but at the end of the day, you want to be in a place where you can say, listen, this is what we have done for you, and you would not have been here but for our cooperation. And, and Laura, when you're advising clients now, what cases are you pointing to to say, see, that's an example of the benefit of cooperation? I mean, Mark mentioned the Kronos case this morning. There are a number of cases recently. Um, there's the Headspin case, the CHS case, um, where there was no penalty imposed. There are an equal number of cases where there was a penalty imposed. Um, and so I think um, it's going to be so fact specific in terms of the type of cooperation a particular investigation needs in order to be able to say to the SEC, this is what we have done. Bill, you've, you've been doing this for longer than all of us combined. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what has changed in your practice when it comes to cooperation that you're doing differently now than you were doing, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago? You know, um, the hardest thing is what 
Lara just alluded to, which is you try to you try to describe for the client what we might get if we do this versus what we might get if we don't do it. And and I've heard uh, people on the staff say, well, you, you got half credit for cooperation, half of what? I mean, that's <laughs> the big problem you have because at the end of the day, you're you're basically going into the staff with your hat in your hand and asking them for credit and, and their judgment on this is, is what's gonna be dispositive. One of the things I never say to the client is if we help them get there sooner rather than later, it'll help. The client will say, what the hell, are you out of your mind? I don't wanna help them get anywhere, right? But, but it, it um, my analysis of this largely is that the cost of the process and resisting sometimes is so prohibitive and you may as well try to get done, get the staff comfortable with whatever that they are interested in, get to resolution and characterizing that as credit for cooperation, however you want to do it. It probably benefits the company because the drag, the PR, the damage internally, the speculation among employees, you have individuals um, and the enormous disruption of life in a corporate entity when people are thinking, I may lose my job, my, my license to be an accountant. Let's get through this as quickly as we can. It doesn't mean we're gonna concede everything and roll over and, and, and agree that we were part of the Lindbergh kidnapping, <laughs> but it means if we have problems, let's figure out what they are, put a box around them, try to deal with them, and then try to sell the staff on a reasoned disposition. Reason disposition is really the, the big challenge because they are calculating what can I sell upstairs? And, and that is another variable in the, with the commission that today is much harder to calculate than it was mm -hmm. when I was there. Mm -hmm. I knew where they were, what they wanted to do, and we could argue with them. And there were arguments, spirited battles between the staff and the commission. Today, I, I I have a much more cynical perspective on the views of the commissioners and how that should play into settlement and penalties and w what the commission does when people are alleged to have broken the rules than I, than I did when I was in the building. Now maybe that's just the chair in which you're sitting, but it's a, yes. it, it is a very, <laughs> it, it's a, well, well, I'll be honest with you. If you pulled the defense bar, they would tell you that the political climate today is one that, that you know, colors very much where the commissioners come out on things. And, and um, I'm not sure that's a really good thing for the agency, but you know. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of levers to pull when you're negotiating a settlement, uh, the headspin case caught my attention from January of, of, of this year where the SEC appeared to credit the fact that the company had forced the CEO to resign, um, are you seeing, I'll start with maybe Sandra and then, then Bill, are, are you seeing more pressure these days from the staff to force out executives than you used to see in the past? Um, so I, I don't know if Headspin is the perfect example. My recollection is that was a bad actor case, and so it was sort of an easy decision to um, make him leave the company. But um, I, I want to go back to a cooperation thing for, for individuals. I, the short answer is yes, there is pressure on companies to remediate, and often that includes removing people um, now more than ever. But um, Bill, I'm curious what your view is on cooperation for individuals, and Stacy, you too. To, as far as I know, the staff hasn't articulated, maybe ever, what it means for an individual subject to a subpoena to cooperate. It's not just that you show up and produce documents and all that, right? That's not enough. That's your just lawful obligation, to your point, Stacy. What would be really helpful is if we and the defense bar had some guidance on what it means for an individual. Is there a seaboard for individuals? How should we guide our clients in thinking about cooperation when we are in, as Bill says, this political 
world, what do they get for cooperating? I, mean, I, I think individuals now, the Lisa Monaco memo is, is part of it from the department. I think you're in the crosshairs if you're an individual. Um, I think you can cooperate and you can plead and you can, but uh, depending upon what the facts are, I don't think there's a lot of uh, sympathy by the regulators over the magnitude and, and, and uh, impact of the sanction on individuals. Yeah. To your point, Brad, on the climate now, I think the climate in the boardroom has changed dramatically in 20 years, and board members now are thinking about their own reputation and liability and are much more prepared to look at the C-suite and the people in the chain of command and say, if you screwed up or made a mistake, you know, we're prepared to let you go, or you're gonna, we're gonna go our separate way, but we're not gonna own that because of personal friendships and loyalty. Um, and I think really that began to change post Enron and WorldCom. Hmm. Suddenly directors had their own reputations on the line, and I think the climate with respect to uh, individuals has changed dramatically internally. Mm -hmm. Stacy, um, can individuals get any sort of cooperation credit if they're wrongdoers? Uh, is, there any, is there any credit to be had uh, in those instances? I mean, I think it's really a facts and circumstances case. You have, a, I mean, the Headspin example, uh, the idea that the SEC was, you know, pulling the strings on forcing the CEO to resign is just nonsensical. Um, you know, the CEO was at the center of the misconduct. So um, we do, uh, you know, build to your point earlier, we take um, our jobs very seriously. We understand the impact of an investigation, both in resources and reputation to a company or an individual, and we understand um, you know, the impact of the remedies we're seeking. We, we, we know, and, and we know, you know, oftentimes that's why you end up litigating, because you're talking about someone's right. career. Um, so we do take it seriously, but at the same time, you know, we have a mission. Um, we need to protect investors, and, you know, when we look at, at sanctions, we're looking at, you know, what will protect investors from future misconduct. So um, we don't take these things lightly. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're thinking about cooperation as an individual, um, you can't just dismiss the idea of what do we need to do to protect the uh, public. Mm -hmm. and, and one dy dynamic that, that also seems to have changed is the presence of parallel criminal investigations now, where um, more and more we see the U.S. Attorney's Office involved as well side by side with the SEC, or in parallel, I should say, with the SEC. Um, Sandra, how does that change the calculus when you're talking about individuals? You represented a number of individuals, um, high-ranking in companies. Do you just batten down the hatches with the SEC and just say, I'm going to focus on the criminal side? Or at what point do you get in line? Do you get, do you get in line? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you really have a criminal problem, it's, it's likely get in, get in line. Um, I, I'm curious your experience, though, Lara, on this in, in from the New York office with a very active local prosecutor? From the SEC experience, I would say, um, you know, generally speaking, it's more efficient to have both the SEC and the criminal authorities in the room together hearing the story um, one time from an individual because otherwise, um, I think that um, there can be problems caused by having to tell the story twice um, sure. But, you know, I'm not sure how my views on that might change, you know, coming from, <laughs> from the other side. We'll see. Bill, in the last uh, closing minutes, we're all interested to know the, the secrets of your trade. Um, what is it have you found when you're negotiating with the staff that you say, this is what I do different than everyone else, and this is why I'm more effective than anyone else? Well. I only represent innocent clients. So that, yeah. Obviously. Um, generally. Uh, now, look, I think we probably, most of us do things th the same way. And I think uh, anybody who's got experience on both sides of the table in particular helps you understand what the staff is thinking. And agree or disagree, 
you got to get your client to the other end with the best possible outcome. And if that means litigation, so be it. But that's basically your job. And you got to preserve your own credibility. Yeah. Terrific. Well said. That was excellent. Really, really interesting. I appreciate that very much. Great, great job moderating, Brad.